my name's Richard Burkett, and I'm uh, I, I'm here to do a, a bit of a talk. It's not a talk that I, I've done very frequently previously, so so it's probably new to you, which I, I do hope so. Um, I'm going to be looking at unlocking the power of large language models, enhancing user engagement by leveraging a data graph and linked data. And speaking with uh, with David um, a few minutes ago, this seems to be AI. That is seems to be something which is pervasive within the the topics that you're covering today. So it's it's good that I've got something which may be um, complementary to that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to take the full hour, which means that you'll almost certainly have time for questions. If you if you wish, you can follow up by emailing me um, as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, welcome to day two. Hope you've got those snacks ready. So I'm going to begin really with if my computer will work, um, we, with saying that we we know that really there's there's nothing new about this. That that people go into the the library um, probably less than we would have liked. We know that work conducted in this case by Ohio Link that library users comparatively rarely begin in the library, and that there's many reasons for for, for this actually being the occurrence. But the usage of resources um, and, and the non-library start points are consistently being leveraged indicates that it's it's not just the users that disfavor the library but rather it's a, a missing piece of the information landscape and one that's really important and that it's the library collection as represented within uh, the library that people would really like access to but they choose to follow the path of maybe least resistance so we know that this is something that's been studied in many cases um, and not to start on something which is um, which is negative, but to put the problem statement really, I think, in front of people that really already know this. Now, the, the way forward is, I think, becoming more widely recognised and that in, I guess in the in the past 18 months or so, we've seen some fairly clear trends within the library world. And I wanted to cover four of these, really. Um, I think they're probably some of the, the big four uh, that other people will be familiar about. So the first one is actually the one I'm not going to talk about quite so much right now. This is about the Library of Congress and their move towards a linked data future. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be covering this as a case study in a few minutes. And it's certainly, I think, worth spending some time looking at, at this. Uh, I think we also see that leaders within the library industry are coming out with preparatory tools that use graph technology. And sometimes these are original graphs and sometimes they're connecting existing graphs together. And I'm sure you, you, you've seen much of, of what I, I mentioned here. Then we've got the, uh, the very well um, recognized generative AI uh, that's not new. We've, but we have certainly seen the rapid adoption of generative AI, I think, in the in the past 18 months, really, in the, in the public space. And what's happening with tools like ChatGPT and others is, I think, aligned quite a lot with what's going on within Folio. And that's that both are taking a problem that's hard and trying to make it as easy as possible for people to use. And then... Fourth, we have uh, really the original problem statement that I, I, I spoke about in the last slide. Users don't begin within the library, but on the open web. So we need to speak about sharing data outside of the library in order to engage the users that know the libraries where the highest quality information is housed. So in addition to these primary issues that we are seeing over the, the past decade or more, we see that large language models base the content that's used in training these generative AI coming from the web. And if authoritative data, and by that I mean library data isn't showing up on the web, then it's understandable that the large language models, um, it, it appears missing within those models. And missing information can contribute to widely reported generative AI hallucinations because all the AI is doing with that data that it has is to predict the next word. And we're seeing from research that EBSCO's conducted, as well as other preprints, that 
if we integrate large language models with a knowledge graph, then we can increase the accuracy of the results by up to 56%, which actually we believe can be developed further as data graphs and, uh, and library data to get better. And that's the direction really that I'm gonna be taking today. And I'll speak a, a, a bit more about what we've done to date, but, but in a nutshell, really we've taken marked data and we've converted it into linked data. And each library gets its own data graph, and this is connected across a network of data. We can also work with the library to make their data better by connecting their data graph, their, their linked data that goes into the data graph, to other authoritative data sources. Now, I'll cover some of these um, in a little while. We do this in a few ways. Firstly, we construct the URIs from any strings in marked records uh, when we've got the authority record connected. Or we can connect it to other libraries that use authoritative sources, and we call this process enrichment. It's really joining um, graph to graph. We find this approach is, is able to bring users into the library from, um, from tools that they expect to use, things like Google, um, where your, your data graph is, is picked up by Google. It, it takes uh, really two business days, uh, give or take. And, and this allows data that has been picked up from um, the, the, the knowledge graph that I'm, I'm going to describe shortly um, and, uh, and picked up by Google. And then it allows you to do things like search for um, a book in Google and find the closest library to you um, or have one that's that's pinned. Uh, so that's kind of the backdrop to what I'm going to be talking about. But, but really, why aren't catalogs visible today on the web? And, and when I when I was looking at, at developing this slide, I was thinking, well, actually, there's a there's a conference presentation at, in Charleston. And it was, I think, 2007, 2008. And it was called um, Mark is Dead, Long Live Mark. And it was delivered by a lady called Jane Burke. And I think at the time, I didn't understand it. And I think we've all had really quite complex relationships with Mark. Uh, and of course, it's it's pervasive. There has been the desire to change from Mark as the bibliographic record that is pretty universal onto something that is less locked in, uh, that can be utilized in web connected environments. And this is what I, I, I mean really by that point where it says data is not connected. So within within the silos that we have in our library, understanding that the data we have in those silos is fantastically authoritative. If we are able to make that transformation into a model that's going to be able to utilize the authority of the data in the catalogs, as well as uh, joining other sources through enrichment, then we're gonna be in a position to be able to work with um, our various communities to find data in different ways, in different forms, and go to the place that um, that our different communities expect us to be. Um, I almost didn't show this slide, um, but I, I'm, I think I'm probably quite, quite glad that I did. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's just a little bit of a glossary, quite a short glossary about what I'm talking about here in terms of linked data, knowledge graphs, and large language models. So it's um, linked data is the, the, the structured data that is represented by relationships within um, within those those data uh, entities. And once we have many of these together and those relationships, corresponding relationships within the linked data um, are understood in a broader context, then that forms a knowledge graph. And, and, and large language models utilize um, tools, that, they, they use data that is web enabled in order to train those generative AI models. So I shan't dwell on this, uh, but probably worth putting in. And why is having this linked data and why is having the, the the move from Mark into a different format, considering Mark has been around for so long, why why is it important? And, and, and why should it be um, given any uh, any airtime when um, certainly all of you and, and people within my side of the library equation as well are very, very busy? Well, it's because we need to increase that engagement. And you know, going back to the Ohio link, um, infographic that I showed right at the very start, we need to find ways of uh, of increasing that engagement. And really, in terms of the collections we've got, those physical collections, um, we, we need to make sure that we are able to rehash, reuse, and repurpose the data we've got in a way that is, um, is, is useful to our, our different communities. There's nothing new about wanting to do this. Uh, uh, and, and there's nothing new within 
library land, but there's certainly nothing new within the broader context of the information industry and other industries. So in other industries, um, really, I'm, I'm thinking here, uh, examples in retail and agriculture and the like, the, the problem was noted of siloed data you know, a long time ago. And and the I think to, to, a, to a degree, those industries have been successful in de-siloing this data by, by applying a, you know, a common vision. And you've probably heard of schema.org uh, collaboration uh, between the big players of Google, Microsoft, and, and Yahoo, um, 2011, 2012. Well, EBSCO has been a, a big supplier of Bibframe um, for a, actually for quite a long time, for about seven or eight years. Uh, and we have the first production ready service that's completely focused on linked data within libraries and the work that we're doing with Library of Congress and with their decision to move to Folio um, has kind of, it, it's, it's it's allowed um, this 2012 statement to uh, to begin to be really addressed. And um, that's what I'm, I'm gonna talk about, uh, about novelly packaging up this data. So the case study of the Library of Congress, it was around about 18 months ago, the Library of Congress selected EBSCO to replace their incumbent, li incumbent library system with, with Folio. And the next few slides will look at what we're doing within this project and the work done with the Library of Congress um, that can be utilized in other libraries. I think it's worth pointing out that the Library of Congress doesn't want um, doesn't want uh, a bespoke Library of Congress system. It wants to have um, a, a means by, uh, by, by elevating where we go with bibliographic description. Um, and so that's really what I'll, I'll talk about in the next few slides. So what is it that we're, we're building with Library of Congress? So we we're building um, we're building a new architecture. Actually, it's we call this data dot graph, and we've used this approach in other parts of EBSCO, but we've taken the opportunity to take that technology and all the lessons we've learned from it and make actually large portions of it open source, so others can use this to move beyond mark if that's what they choose to do, um, and and that choose thing is really really important. There's no mandating the move to Bibframe from Mark. And uh, indeed, that's uh, something which I'd, I'd really like to resonate with you. Um, but in the movement to uh, data.graph, we're, we're able to look towards a more machine readable and web friendly format. But to get to that position, we need to have uh, the ability to transform the, the data from where it is now to where it uh, where it's going, and we call this a transformation pipeline. Um, some of you who have gone through these kind of processes maybe will know it is an ETL pipeline. Uh, the process takes Mark and using a set of rules that's been really a collaboration of many many libraries defines the links within the data to form the data graph. And for every person, place, and thing, we create a link and a relationship between them, so that we take the original Mark data and we transform it into Bibframe to create the data graph. And as Folio is format agnostic, it, it, it really has been built at the wishes of the community to be absolutely agnostic to the, to the format. Then the data graph forms the architecture, um, <coughs> excuse me, of the collection within, um, within Folio. Um, and I, I don't necessarily say Library of Congress Folio because this is, um, th this is an open source project which allows all libraries to capitalize upon the work done with you know, the largest libraries in the world, with the likes of Library of Congress, and cascade that to, to some of the smallest um, libraries in the world as well. So once we've got this, this ETL, the transformation process, we need somewhere to store those data. And the graph does include storage. Um, this is a, a new type of schema inside Folio that allows tracking of linked data resources. There's a, around about 90 different classes that can be seen in the inventory. Um, and, and this is what we've transformed the data held in, in Bibframe. But what about Mark? Um, it, it, we, we, we're, we're really not going to simply move on, um, simply because there's, there's there's no reason that we would want to jettison Mark um, for Bibframe, certainly in a transition uh, period, which may be many, many, many months, if not, uh, sorry, years, if not decades. But the, there's also other reasons why we wouldn't do that as well. One, of course, um, that we we don't want to see the the death of Mark is that there's there's a long relationship that we've had with Mark and although the relationship has certainly been strained at points, um, tools within uh, Library of Congress mean and, and certainly when we look at 
sorry, we, we look at the cataloging distribution service. Um, it's it, it's something that we uh, we really want to preserve because it's a tool that is in use within many parts of, um, of the information industry. And Folio uh, will, will certainly um, uh, pay credence to that. In terms of the sharing and the portability of data, um, linked data is, is really an intrinsic part of what we're doing with the, the Library of Congress Folio system. But sharing of data is, is really, really paramount here as well. So the data can be taken and used across different systems. For example, if we had open source discovery services, uh, in fact, any discovery service. And the challenge of Mark was not that the data is being locked within your own graph, but that access to those endpoints are, are in a place which you, you may not be able to get access to. And with the service that's being developed, that's no longer an issue because of the linked nature of, of the data. Um, We'll also see that, that trusting cataloging sources such as the Library of Congress and the ability to feed data into other folio libraries um, is going to become increasingly important. Uh, and to that, we need a, a mechanism whereby we can edit and describe um, data within the folio environment. And we call that Marva. Um, so Marva is an application that was initially built by the Library of Congress for the description of resources. And Marva contains many profiles. Uh, for example, it, it's got manuscripts and rare books and loads and loads of other things. Uh, but what we're doing within the project at the moment is we're elaborating on this and we're integrating the Marva editor uh, into Folio. But we're also ensuring that that's, the, the Marva editor can be used externally to Folio, so it can be used by other applications. So that would allow libraries that, that don't have Folio to utilize a bib frame editor um, in, in their workflows. And quite frequently, I, I go back to um, this quote, and, and you'll have seen it, I'm sure, in many, many places. Um, it's from Linus, the, the gentleman who developed the Linux kernel. Um, and with, with linked data features, I think it, how, I, how I see this, it allows you to, to take control of your own destiny, much as, 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 as Linus um, exposes here with, with real open source and, and the, the control of destiny that you can take in, in that context. It allows us to look at creative ways of engagement with um, systems and services and workflows that we have um, all over the, the information industry. So that adage of being able to rehash, repurpose, and display content in places that maybe we've not been able to do in the past, I think is going to be increasingly important. But in doing so, of course, we we, we need to have that cooperation. Um, and cooperation within the context of the, the, the EBSCO, uh, Folio, and Library of Congress um, project is is ongoing but of course there's bigger projects there as well um and and you yeah, know what we're what we're looking at, at doing here is is really elaborating on that the the cooperation of the the, the global folio project um looking at uh, new ways new stores new ways to you know ways to explore collections new system architectures um, and that system architecture um is also important so this is something that we, we we're doing um with uh, with Library of Congress, but also with others uh, around the world as well. It's it's looking at engagement and cooperation uh, really from the start to the finish of, of the process. Um, and it points to the objectives and vision of, of Folio supporting entity-based um, data models. And, and from the start of the, the Folio project, the community has and always will have um, it really, it's heart of, the heart of Folio. Um, it's about how functionality is driven forward. So EBSCO works with this community, but we also work with other communities as well. So yeah, we, we work as a consultant to the BibFrame Interoperability Group because what we want to do um, to support our, 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 our friends and colleagues within the library world is to look at developing that best practice and a cozy co put my teeth back in, a cohesive approach across the, the industry. And so this I, I, I this isn't nebulous stuff. This is this stuff is coming really, really quickly. Um, 
the, the first iteration of the Library of Congress folio deployment happens in sort of September, October this year. But before that, I, th I think um, next month, April, um, there's going to be the, the Marvel editor is, is going to be um, available within uh, the Library of Congress folio. I believe that's correct. Um, so what can you do today? Because the Library of Congress is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a big project, a very significant project moving along at a pace. But the problem exists uh, right now for libraries that want to engage with uh, with, with various communities in various different ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, the problem statement, really, it's the same as I mentioned previously. That the data in the libraries have got um, have, have got have curated for a very long time. Um, it remains locked in in silos, but it, it also remains as really authoritative and very, very good data. Um, and that means that the representation of those data within web environments and the relationship between the different data entities um, is is not established. And in turn, this means that the users can't engage with those resources because not only is the data not where the user expects it to be, but also the relationships between the data don't forge new insights into the library collection, those relationships between um, a subject and an object. And that's not just problematic when we look to use the catalog as a, a resource, but it's problematic when we uh, we understand that those highly curated and descriptive metadata can't be used in the context of large language models, which are trying to predict that next word. What is it that the, the person is going to want next? And hence why generative AI hallucinations continue to make their, the headlines. Um, but if we're able to use large language models um, with more authoritative data, then we've got a better chance of, of, of hitting that next word. Conversely, of course, if, if as, as now maybe the data is less complete than we would have wanted, then uh, the large language models make their predictions on less than perfect information. And without critical analysis skills, the information that's provided to your library users um, from these generative AI tools may be consider, considered accurate by them, Hence the disclaimers that we see to check the generative AI responses on the front page of all of their tools. Um, so the problem is, is definitely there. And we have ways that we can look to address this. Um, the conversion and syndication of, of high quality and credible data could be argued as, as really never more important with the backdrop of large language models and generative AI. And it, it really is, I, I, I would contest the responsibility of both the library and organizations such as EBSCO uh, that supply services to the library to, to really work together to, to engage with our users in different ways and make sure that when generative AI is used, that the data that we are, are training those generative AIs on is as authoritative as, as we can make it. And here's just six ways that we can look to bridging that, that gap. Um, they're not the only ways. There are plenty of other ways that we can work. But um, but these are, are, are just six. So that initial transformation, I would suggest, is foundational. Um, once we've got that data in uh, a way that is is meaningfully interlinked data, we syndicate it to a data graph, um, and we can pick out the aspects of of the collection within living lists, perpetual lists, which are tailored to the needs of our different communities and delivered um, in web environments where they need to be, enriching resources. Um, from other data sources, whether that's um, in the case of Library of Congress, at least um, LC NAF or VIAF or, or wherever else, ORCID. Um, and, and then wanting to make sure that if we are taking the time and effort to, uh, to take this highly curated data and transform it, we need to be able to put it where people are gonna be on the web. So driving people back from where they expect to find information, um, actually back to the library catalog and driving usage that way. And then, it, it, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I mentioned it earlier on, but, but to make sure that folks can show up within a Google search and they can borrow a book from within Google and they get directed to um, a, an endpoint, which makes sense, is an important thing for people to be able to do. And also for libraries to be able to, um, to say, yes, I am there in Google. I do have my data in a way that's syndicated towards the, the Google knowledge graph. And when people do search in you know, Google for simple, fast and easy, then we have the ability not just to, to, uh, to buy a, a book, but also to borrow that book from a local library maybe.
and then increasingly to join a, a network of libraries, a connected network of, of graphs from libraries, from trusted metadata sources, so that those um, important um, important resources that you all uh, curate so uh, so heavily are available um, in different means to different communities. So looking at an example of how we take these data in Mark and, and we convert them, this is um, to you Dortmund who, who, who utilizes this service. So we'll we'll take the, the and we're using a, an example, well-trodden example of, uh, of Albert Einstein. So we take the data in, in Mark format um, and we have the, uh, the, the, the notion here of creator. So, um, so the creator is Albert Einstein. Um, we we know that this is um, has a unique position within the data graph, and that's the F4 KZN F0S um, identifier in blue at the end. And this positions this creator within the context of the the, the, the data graph. Um, and once we have that position and that unique identifier, we have that for not just the subject, in this case, the, the work, the Brownian movement work, the object, which is the, uh, the creator, the person that created this, Albert Einstein. And we've, we've also got a unique identifier um, with that relationship to the predicate. And we call these um, bib frame resources. Uh, and we amplify these further when we look at how the data is represented within the graph. So here we've we've simply put the data into graph DB. And from this, we can see that we have, you know, the, the gentleman in in, uh, in context here, Albert Einstein, um, and we have the, the, the work that was created by him. And we have, uh, if you see between those two blue circles, the creator. Um, and so we know that within this data graph, we have the subject and the object and the predicate. And of course, within this, the data graph expands based on the number of identifying um, predicates and the number of uh, different entities that we have here as well. When we start moving this um, into connected graphs, um, it starts to get, I think, quite interesting. So you as a library right now can, can you know, convert your, your data um, from Mark into BibFrame, and that's and you, 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 you probably get quite a lot out of that. Um, that data is then syndicated to um, the library link network. So this is the, the data graph and, and it, it's open. So library A and library B can see what common resources they have as well as which independent resources. And this may open um, an interesting world in terms of, um, of who has the last copy of sharing of resource, um, of looking at whose collection um, is authoritative in a particular way. And there's uh, an example that, that we have where University of Melbourne was looking at some work that had been done by the University of East Anglia, um, who, who don't subscribe to this, by the way, but um, but we, we have tested their, their data um, within the data graph. And because of some of the work that was ongoing with decolonization, the University of Melbourne was able to reference that work within the data graph and look at their collection versus um, versus what UEA had done, uh, which I think was was actually quite a valuable exercise. In terms of what we do to uh, to enhance these resources, because you know, it's great getting the data from libraries, but there's also lots and lots of other authoritative data sources out there, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, as I'm sure you're aware. But we can take data from these sources and we can automate the inclusion of these data within your data, so within your, your, your data graph. Um, and this means that if we're looking at engaging with our users in different ways, we can add in you know, that ORCID data, the Crossref data. You know, we, we've been working quite a lot with, with Wikidata. Um, whatever you would con consider to be authoritative, and we do have quite a long list of other sources that we're going to be plumbing into, um, plumbing into the system. Um, here's, you know, if we if we went to Albert Einstein in in, in Wikidata, uh, we can see that there's certainly you know, non-English language inclusions of, of, of names here, um, and that might be very very important 
when it comes to engaging different communities that we that we have. We see the same thing um, with Library of Congress. Uh, and so what we do in terms of bibliograph is that we will take those mappings uh, and pull in the data as required um, so that we're effectively joining those uh, those graphs together. Uh, once we've joined those graphs together, once we've mapped them, uh, we're able to portray the, the data in lots and lots of really, really flexible ways. Um, and the reason why it's so flexible, the reason why we um, associate multiple graphs together, <coughs> excuse me, is that, that that goal of engaging the user and engaging the user where they where they are, where they expect to find um, data is is very, very important. And so these um, th this is a representation of um, of items by Albert Einstein and also items about Albert Einstein. Um, and we're able to very clearly differentiate this. Um, instantly, if you were to click on one of these, you would be directed to um, to the, you know, the Council of Resorts, maybe, or Discovery Service. Um, it, it also means that we can um, we can show off our collections, and we 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 should be super proud of doing exactly that thing. And the collections that that I've been fortunate to 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 view in many libraries have been absolutely wonderful, and 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 would be fantastic additions to people's studies and general interest if we can go to where they expect us to be. Um, and so we can create these knowledge panels that changes our collection changes. We can define them really, really accurately. Um, we can uh, put them into faculty pages and lib guides and stick them on blogs and put them in socials, um, all because that is where the collection is going to be um, potentially viewed by our usership. And we. Um, we 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 utilize this in quite a lot of different places. So this is how the European Parliament um, define um, some of their collections. So this one is about European citizenship, uh, and they can go in and they can engage people within uh, their lib guides, and they they make quite heavy use of, um, of 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 this service within their lib guides. But then we can also look at how we can um, appear on the, you know the most general of generalist searches, and that. Um, and that if you are searching for a, a book and, uh, and and you want to find it, then traditionally you would have the ability to buy that book from you know one of the, the, the regular players. But increasingly, the work that we've done with Google um, over the past sort of six or seven years has enabled us to um, to to ensure that in some geographies, and those geographies are expanding, that the ability to borrow a book from within Google is a reality in the US, Canada, Australia, and the UK. Um, and, and that's, you know, in, in the case of this, if I search for um, uh, fundamentals of the structural geology, uh, then it would geolocate me or I can or I can pin this, uh, which is is good in terms of the workflows that we that we have. So you find your book within you know, what to read. Um, you have the borrow action associated, um, and then you get delivered to where you would need to be. Um, we're, we're not the only folks to to offer this, and I think that's also part of the community. Uh, but we do uh, we do have frequent meetings with Google in order to look at how we can use the data we've got in order to um, to to be able to fulfil uh, the expectations of of library users. Getting towards the end, and thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, there's a there's a lot going on, an awful lot going on in terms of linked data at EBSCO. And I, I've tried to use the case study um, at the moment of, of Library of Congress, simply because you know, it's a, a fairly major library, I think you'll probably agree. Um, but there's there's other things that we 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 have. We we've got um for, for actually for, for many years, we've had a knowledge graph associated with EBSCO discovery service. Um, and, uh, and and some of that work that we've previously done um, has been made open source. Uh, we can also look at, at ways that we can share other work that we've done. For example, you know, the stuff that we've done with the discovery service, um, it, it would be nice if we could bring this preparatory graph technology of subjects and concepts that allow data visualization in EDS to other applications. Um, it's something that we're looking looking towards maybe doing. And then as we continue to work on bibliograph 
and learn more and develop the service into other arenas. Um, we, we, we look at what's needed in developing um, different models. At the moment, you know, Bibliograph works with around about 20 different library systems and you know, five or 10 different discovery services. Um, but it's very closely aligned to, to Folio. And it, although it's aligned, it's kept external so that it can retain its ability to work with those many different systems. It's, you know, it wants to be able to fulfill its promise rather than being tied into uh, one system or service. It also means there's no additional pressure on Folio um, that, that can be leveraged. You know, so Bibliograph can be, or Bibframe Bibliograph can be leveraged as one of a number of different tools that we've got connected to Folio rather than being part of Folio. Um, Bibliograph, maintains its its contact with the folio community the, uh, the 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 data structures that i've highlighted in the work that we're doing with library of congress are very very important and this is something that you know is going to be part of one of the next releases of folio so that you know the smallest library in the world that has folio um can have the cutting edge um bibliographic tools that i've, I've described um and the the direction of folio and bibliograph they certainly are aligned but we're also thinking about how we move beyond bibliographic and yeah we we we, we certainly start in this world and the, the challenges of course as I've, I've mentioned is that mark keeps data locked inside catalogs and the the data are not connected and getting access to the the data between different systems that flow of data between different systems is really hard <laughs> but increasingly we're looking at different uh, parts of the information space and realizing that data portability is is important not just in in the library system um, to avoid things like vendor lock-in to, to to really facilitate data exchange between different organizations and enable users to retain control over their own data and that's something that we're we're looking towards um, as beyond bibliographic. And to be on, I, I think that, you know, the cutting edge of some of these services is really exciting. Uh, and the, the more that we work and learn within this area, the more possibilities that we uncover. It's, um, I, I think this is where we, we begin to, to really get into the practical application of what does beyond bibliographic data mean. Um, and of course, that also means further extensions to link data models, and they require support. Yeah, the, the different um, the, the different extensions are going to require support. Uh, and as an example of that, actually, we we recently worked with the LNET consortium in Estonia, which is headed up by the National Library of Estonia, uh, on a, a set of of really complex and disparate repositories containing like really many, many types of, of data. And these are um, audio recordings, uh, video recordings, um, PDFs, images, um, sound recordings, all sorts of different things. And what we did is we took these data uh, working in partnership with Knowledge Integration, who you may know, and we normalized the data into a, a JSON format that was then enriched by bibliograph data. So the data that we took, I think it was 19 repository, normalizing that data um, into a, a unified format and um, that normalization process allowed us to have not 19 different administration interfaces and data flows but just one which harmonized the process and allowed the ability to look at the data and um, throughput of, of, of all the different sources of data of course we we took this data into the json format and we um we've created it you know its own data graph which allows us to also use the, the bibliograph data to enrich that, that repository data. Thinking about what we want to do here is we want to take the, the metadata, which may be in some cases complete, some cases less so, um, and wherever possible, apply as much as we can in order to facilitate the discovery of this material in the context that um, is appropriate to that material. So we've we've developed um, a, a really nice modern user interface for this that potentially could be repurposed into you know other other projects, and this is important because you know we've we've now got these data which you know they go off to Europeana and they they can be put into lots of different um, other contexts, but importantly we also show the relationships between 
these cultural assets um, and the new pathways that people can get to this authoritative information that they weren't able to do so uh, beforehand. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of shoot for around about half an hour. I've, I've gone over um, by 10 minutes. So my apologies for that. Um, but uh, if you've got any questions, then yeah, do do please ask them or um, find me a, an email. I'll be very happy to um, to try and help. I'm going to go to the Q and A, see if there's anything we we have here. So we've got a, an anonymous attendee. Is this something that could be trialed with a catalogue such as the JISC Library Hub? I've seen no problem with that at all. Um, it's uh, it, it's something that yeah, this is a journey that we. We're going on with lots of different libraries um, and it's something that please do email me and we'll unpack that a little bit more. Um, William, hey William. Um, Richard, can you say something about the rights associated with bibliographic records um, and whether the current regime works to support the innovations you've been describing or hinders them? I don't know, William, if I am qualified to answer that. Um, from, my, from my fairly basic perspective, and I'm very likely wrong, um, is that library catalogue data that you have within your, your system is, is, is your data. We don't want to convert um, you know, data from a particular vendor um, into records that would cause any legal strife. We want to elaborate on the connections between those different um, data entities to allow the discovery of that material rather than um ra rather than cause problems associated with um with the rights you 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 or others may hold 